for uh, getting up with me. It is 10. I'm not going to hold you uh, that late, but I want to talk to you about something that I believe is on the heart of God for you right now. We are still praying for Dallas, and I know that it seems that the um, uh, the the unfortunate, uh, uh, grievous uh, crisis in Dallas with the shooting of several of the police officers out there has seemed to glare over uh, the other two events, uh, the one in Baton Rouge and the other one uh, in Minnesota. But I am grieving uh, as God is over the entire ordeal. I believe that the lives lost in Dallas are just as significant as the lives lost, lo lives lost in Baton Rouge and also the lives lost uh, in, in Minnesota. Uh, so prayers to all of those families uh, that are suffering. Seems as if the media has uh, put more emphasis on uh, the, the lives that were lost in Dallas. But I am grieved over the entire chain of events, uh, but also encouraged that the Lord has not forgotten about America. So uh, keep our nation in prayer. Uh, keep her preachers in prayer, her voices in prayer, and uh, I'm sure it's going to turn towards a direction of victory for the people of God. All right, I have something uh, to talk to you about very quickly um, that I think you really need to monitor in your heart. First of all, I'm going to give you some advice. Thank you, first of all, for all of you that are sharing this. I really appreciate the hearts and I appreciate you sharing. Prophet Dolores Gadsden, I see you in here. I miss you so much, woman of God. Um, first of all, let me make a suggestion to you, and then I'm going to uh, talk to you about something. And the suggestion that I'm going to make to you is this. Um, I believe that the way things are going and the way God is dealing with so many right now around the world uh, concerning their uh, destiny, concerning their assignment, concerning their purpose, concerning their potential. I think that one of the, the disciplines you need to develop is the discipline of consistently examining your heart. Paul made recommendation that we examine ourselves. And often when you find a person that is sensitive to critique, to criticism, to correction, a sensitive to um, accusation and all of those things that are inevitable if you're going to make progress, um, a part of what they're revealing to you is that they are so uh, unaccustomed to having people critique them because they themselves are not often in a position of self-examination. So self-examination really does afford you the opportunity um, to be braced when there is an accusation or when there is a, a, a dart, a dagger, when there is a charge against your, your character, your person, uh, any of that from another person. The reason why it tends to hit so many of us so hard is because we have not made them, made that a habit of our own selves. I believe that if we would make it a priority to examine ourselves that we would kind of develop uh, a tough skin when it comes to the criticisms that other people have. The, the reason why other people's criticisms carry so much weight is because we have not built our lives in such a way that it's open to adjustment, arrangement, structure, order, and maneuvering around certain behaviors that qualify us to delve into the limitless world of our potential as God has vested in us. So your instruction to prepare you for what I'm about to talk to you about is to deliberately become um, a self-examiner. How am I doing? How am I feeling? How am I processing life and its events? How am I managing the instructions from God? How am I holding fast to or stewarding uh, wisdom? Uh, am I um, in a position where the Spirit of God, either from His heart to my to mine, or or from His heart through our relationships, have I gotten in the way, or have I become a a, a point of obstruction 
to God's ability to clearly deal with me about something that is either offensive or just non-useful. All of those things that go into character, that go into your development and your overall makeup as a person, irrespective of what you do and, and how you serve or what you're going to do. This is applicable to husbands, wives, friends, business owners, preachers, blah. You need to become somebody who examines yourself. And you don't just need to examine yourself on watch night. Major mistake. Don't wait until the last day of the year to give yourself a retrospective re review about how you handled life and how you handled your opportunities and how you managed the moments that were afforded to you by the Lord. So become a person that is accustomed to examining your own self and then you won't be so sensitive when other people make their observations. There is an outbreak right now in the earth and I say this to you prophetically, uh, there is an outbreak in the earth of a level of rebellion that we have not seen ever in America's history. The level of rebellion that has been uh, brought forth in planet earth is manifesting in rage, in murder, in the abuse, of laws, um, it is manifesting in families. I think that it's manifesting in churches. I just think that it's it's a new species of rebellion. The premise of my teaching on deliverance for the next several weeks uh, is that I, this is me. Okay, you may disagree, and should you decide to do so, you can do it on the platforms that you've been afforded. But I can in one word, give a social, cultural, national diagnosis of what is going on with America, her church, her policemen, her families, her economics, her military affairs, so on and so forth. And that word is demonization. It's a word you will be hearing uh, quite commonly from me as we progress throughout the summer months. But I believe, this is me, that this is the most demonically infiltrated generation that America has ever seen. And for this reason, um, our warfare is complex, our view and our vision obscured, and the solutions and the answers are all the more clouded is because there is a point that we are all overlooking as Christians particularly and that Christian is that no matter how many times we march or speak truth to power uh, that we must become aware that there are things there are people at well, or let me say it this way there are persons without bodies things that determine things behind the scenes of our reality that motivate, inspire, uh, conspire people to do things that they wouldn't ordinarily do. Devils, demons, wickedness, the forces of darkness. This is um, a lot for the, the, tr the traditional Christian to understand because most of them have not had any thorough teaching on demons, demonization. We just kind of know that they exist. And we know that they exist and maybe once or twice a year somebody may foam or froth at the mouth and we call it purge in the church and, and so what we do is we get a couple of paper towels, wipe them up, you know, plead the blood and go on with our, our business. But understanding the logic and the work of evil is extremely critical to being able to succeed in your in in life as a Christian on earth. If you cannot accurately, thoroughly, biblically understand evil, uh, its intention, its origin, uh, its objectives, then you don't know what you're living your life to not become. And of course, the only option you've got then is to live your life in mixture and live your life just focusing on the positives, acting as if no negative exists. 
that delusional model and approach to Christianity is the reason why we're in the 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 the, the rut we are in right now as a society is because we were teaching you about being saved, but we didn't go out of our way to thoroughly teach you what you were being saved from. We had the audacity to talk to you about deliverance and being delivered, and the extent of what we painted was that you needed to be set free from a few bad habits that are normal to all human beings. So if you don't really comprehend evil, wicked, demons, curses, bondage, witchcraft, the occult, sorcery, all of the things that have actually been competing for the attention away from the cross since the days of early Israel. I mean, I don't have the time to begin to go into the, the historic, ancient, biblical demonization of the nation of Israel and how many gods they had to be delivered from pre the Messiah. And the reason why Jesus, according to Hebrews 3, 1, had to come manifested as an apostle was because the, the Messiah's climate was so densely, thickly infiltrated with devils that the Old Testament prophets were unsuccessful with pulling Israel out of the sway of them. They were called idols in that day. But all Old Testament idols were simply encasements and, and philosophies that were started by devils. So, you know, I know we think the church is where we go to praise God, but it's a lot more uh, profound than that. Back to my point, the level of rebellion that we have seen born in America in particular uh, is going to require that those of us who believe have the right response. I believe that cultural national uh, a rebellion, uh, uh, gender rebellion, um, I mean, just, just a, a spiritual rebellion, uh, rebellion of family structure and order, rebellion of ecclesiastical uh, structure and order, rebellion to doctrine. I just believe that there's a strong level of rebellion flooding the earth, the spirit of witchcraft. Samuel teaches us that the spirit of rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And then he continues to say that stubbornness is as the spirit is as idolatry. So America is fighting a heightened level of witchcraft because she is fighting a heightened level of rebellion from the White House to the church house to the dope house to the to the crack house. They are all funding, fueling, promoting uh, the agenda of rebellion. And um, so the Spirit of God um, has made it clear through His Word that those of us who belong to Him should practice cultivating an obedient spirit. An obedient spirit. If you are somebody who measures your heart and somebody who evaluates the health of your soul, you should also be somebody who is clearly able to gauge where you are in your obedience level to God. With so much mass spread rebellion going on in the world, the only appropriate reaction of the believer should be to ensure that the depth of their obedience to God far surpasses the depth of their rebellion to him before they became believers. It makes no sense for you to be a terrorist and uh, a conspirator and somebody who just went out of your way to be destructive, be it in your own body or with the bodies of others or just through a life of sin. And then you get saved and then Jesus comes in and he cleans your life and then you begin to pursue uh, a life of holiness and you don't deepen the level of your obedience to excess in general is that they are often not concerned about going higher in their level of obedience to the Lord, making sure that their obedience level does not plateau. In fact, I believe that as you mature as a believer, you should become more obedient. Um, I know this, that it just kind of froze a little bit, so go ahead and reshare it if you can in case anybody got kicked out. 
But as you mature, you should also become more and more obedient. In fact, obedience is the fruit of maturity. So when you are a disobedient person, you are also an immature person. You have not been developed and you have not been cultivated uh, into the likeness of, of God's dear son, the man Christ Jesus. And you are certainly not qualified for any serious authority, power, influence, visibility, or any of that. Because obedience is the beginning of all instructions. In obedience is the beginning of all instructions. Many of you are waiting for your next level of instructions when your last set of instructions have been left lingering, unmanned, unattended to, not catered to, not evaded. That may be the reason behind the silence of God for many of you who are trying to figure out what he's doing or what he wants for this next season. He may not be saying anything to you because you've not followed through with the last thing he told you. And there is no need for him to continue to give you a, a successive uh, uh, lines of instructions when the last set of instructions he gave you are left without being followed so obedience is the beginning place and as you grow in god and as you grow in the things of god furthermore and probably most importantly as you grow in your devotional walk you see this may be too basic for a lot of you but you know i'm not convinced that um believers have the type of walk with god that they like to portray there are people who sing things about knowing God for themselves and, you know, I got a prayer life and I worship and my relationship with God and all that stuff. But you see, you know, how you interact with God, your interactions with God is going to automatically end up displaying itself in the spirit of obedience that is on your life. And uh, so if you have a real walk with God, a daily devotional life, and you are uh, uh, transferring yourself and you are uh, uh, transforming yourself and by the renewing of your mind in the word of God, you are filled with this spirit, you spend quality time with him, then what's going to end up happening to you is over time, the Holy Spirit is going to cultivate an appetite for obedience in you. He's going to cultivate a desire for obedience in you, a yearning to obey him. That spirit of obedience pushes you to and through all of the trials and drills and tests God mandates you go through. The Bible talks about how Jesus Christ was obedient even unto the death. And then it also goes on to say that for the joy of that that was set before him, he endured the cross. Obedience produced the endurance that Jesus needed to go through what he needed to go through so as to achieve his destiny in God. And so I don't think enough people are sensitive enough about how obedient they are. And I also think that because we have a culture that promotes individuality and that actually promotes rebellion and promotes exclusivism and promotes a uh, 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 self-worship and, and promotes all of that, I don't think we are as sensitive as we should be about disobedience in our lives. I think we excuse it. I think we overlook it. I think we don't realize how dangerous it is. I, I think we don't realize how much of God it makes us miss out on. But you've got to know that God put obedience in Jesus Christ. He made him an obedient son. He, the nature of obedience was what got, got Jesus access to everything he had access to. Now, if you look at the life of Jesus Christ, he never had a need. If he had some, if he needed somewhere to lay his head, it wasn't but a matter of days before he had it. If there was a need for him to have money to pay a temple tax, God arranged it. When he needed a continued, everything God needed, Jesus needed, was supplied by the Father because of Jesus' obedience. See, many of you think that God supplied Jesus the man with what he needed because of his assignment. No, 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 no. God does not 
I repeat this, provide for you because you have an assignment. Jesus' access to provision was not because of his assignment. Jesus' access to provision was because of his obedience. All of you have an assignment from the Lord on your life. If you're saved, there is a point, there is a purpose, there is a process of God and a promise that God has for your life. But that's not what determines your provision. No, what determines your provision is your obedience. And God would rather you be obedient than happy, obedient than comfortable, obedient than popular, obedient than liked, obedient than more obedient than free. So, so many of us are pursuing different feelings that we want, you know, happiness, solace, contentment, and God wants those things, but he does not want them more than he wants obedience after you. The deception of this season and of this hour and of this generation is that obedience is more costly than my disobedience. Now, I know you don't really think that, but your your heart, your delay, your hesitancy, your um, procrastination actually reveals that you think that there is less cost to your disobedience than there is benefits for your obedience. But let me just tell you that everything God wants for you will be released in an instant when you learn to live up to the level of obedience necessary for your calling. So many of you have been asking God, what's the hold up? What's the next phase? What's the next? What's the next? You know, a lot of you are asking God all of the resources all of the everything that you need is behind your next level and your next phase of obedience. There's a scripture I want to give you. It's Deuteronomy 28 and 1. Now, we love, we love, 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 love reading the promises of God that are in Deuteronomy 28. I mean, there's some great promises in there. I mean, he promises to bless your bread, your water, all of those things, right? But here is what God really emphasized in Deuteronomy 28. In the NIV, it says, if you fully plans, then the Lord, it says, if you fully obey the Lord your God, and if you carefully follow all of his commands, then he says, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. That's Deuteronomy 28 and 1. So we have a promise that if we fully obey the Lord and his instructions toward us, then he will set us high above all of the nations of the earth. There will be nobody more desired, no, 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 no more favored, no more provided for. You see, learning to develop and cultivate an obedient spirit is going to be one of the greatest keys you could ever develop in your life. It will bless you as an entrepreneur. It will bless you as a father, as a husband, as a wife, as a mother, as a ministry leader, as a father. It, it will bless you if you develop a sensitivity towards what God wants out of you and a propensity to obey him quickly. There is nothing that God will withhold from you. The Lord spoke to me about this subject and said something to me so interesting. He spoke to me and said, there's only one type of a person that I withhold from, and it's the disobedient. It's always used a tremendous amount of restraint. Train himself because he does not desire to withhold anything. He desires all that he wants in his heart for us. But in his love and in his chastisement, some would even argue in his mercy, he will withhold things from the disobedient so as to cause a disobedient to pursue a greater level of cooperation with him, his purpose, his plan, and what he's doing for our lives. Deuteronomy 5 and 33 in the, in the NIV version says, if you walk, walk in obedience, 
to all that the Lord God has commanded you, then you will live long and you will prosper and your days in the land that you possess will be many. The days in the land that you possess will be many. So there were certain guarantees and there were certain promises and there were certain parameters that God gives as far as supply, as far as provision, even as far as abundance is concerned that is unlocked by obedience. See, this is why the whole tithing and offering thing is important. It's not a matter of the law as much as it is a matter of obedience. Some of you are being disobedient and then got the nerve to be decreeing and declaring. The basis of your decree, the basis of your declaration, and the basis of your seed and your offering working for you is that you have done it in an obedient heart. The basis of your deliverance is that you've obeyed and brought your life to the deliverer and giving him full rights and giving him full authority to do what he wants to do in your life. So don't allow progressive contemporary American culture to desensitize you to the dangers of disobedience. Now, for those of you that are isolated, you're not in a church, you're not under teaching, you're not under a leader, you rebel against community, you have no desire to submit yourself to friendships, relationships, you don't have a disciple all of that stuff. I don't know how in the world you think you're mastering becoming obedient. A part of learning obedience is that you've got to learn to subject yourself to a body. I want you to hear this. In your personality, even in your calling, how you are, where you're going, God has put certain weaknesses in you. Now, I know you don't believe that. I know you think that the only thing God put in you is strength. But I believe God also put in you certain weaknesses. He put certain blind spots in you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, deliberately, meticulously. God put certain fractures in your frame to make sure you would always need the body. If he made you as a perfect individual that was incapable of being flawed and, 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 and had the all-seeing, all-knowing eye and counsel for your life choice, his decisions, etc., then you would have no need for the body. But you have certain weaknesses that don't come from the devil. Some of them, some of them blind spots come from the Holy Spirit in his sovereignty, limiting your ability to see everything that is wrong with you. And he uses those fractures in your frame so that you could have a cohesive joining to the community, to the body, to those that you need. That's right, beloved. In your nature, there is something crafted in you you to need. So those of you that don't like to admit need, you don't like to own need, you don't like to articulate need, If the, the idea that you need people or need things or need uh, whatever makes you feel vulnerable and, and, and makes you feel unsafe and made you feel all of that stuff, you see what you're missing is an opportunity to become a cultivated son, one that can become obedient to God and to what he wants in your life. You don't like need, admitting when you need things, you're honory. You lead yourself. You protect yourself. You counsel yourself. You are your own refuge. And when you end up living your life like that, what Satan has done is robbed you of the opportunity to become obedient. Why, you ask? Because the only person you're interested in obeying is yourself. Now, here's a trick. Everybody is obedient to the point where they want to do something that they really want to do. You see, nobody deserves the right to say they're submitted until they are confronted with doing something opposite of what they normally would have done. The only reason you believe that you are submitted is because your submission has not been tested. And your submission has not been tested as long as you always agree with the instructions, the directives, and the processes you're given. You're just temporarily submitted. Real submission is proven when you do things and you are required to do things you honestly do not want to do. Watch me. And you love it. See, if you say, I submitted even though I didn't like it, then you didn't submit. You complied. Submission is about the placement of the will and the placement of strength and the placement of your thoughts. Now, I realize that there are people in the body of Christ that are abusive. 
that are manipulative, that are controlling, that 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 are ill motivated and ill intended. But al allow me to reveal to you what the fear of being controlled has done. It has created in you an indifference towards the subject of submission. See, you're so afraid of being ruled over and controlled and having your will taken from you. See, submitting has nothing to do with somebody monopolizing or controlling or lording over you. Submission is, and that's why it takes a strong person to do it. Rebels are actually extremely weak people. It takes a tremendous amount of strength, of emotional, psychological fortitude to willfully and, 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 and knowingly bring your decisions under the word, the counsel, and the directives of another person. It takes the strong to submit. You've got to be a strong person. So when women tell me, oh, I'm not ready for marriage because I'm not really submissive, what they're really communicating is I am a loud mouth, weak person. I am an assertive, obnoxious, loud talking girl. Because submission is for the strong. Submission is not about losing your intellect. It's not about losing your will. It's not even about losing your desire. It is the placement of strength under an authority, under something that you have placed yourself under. Now, why is this important? Because this is how all authority flows. This is how all favor flows. This is how all blessing flows. It's through the power of obedience. So when God brings you into the context of a community and into the context of, of teaching and under the... Because even, even those of you that are under good teaching, what activates the principles of that teaching is how you obey it. You know, you can't just be somebody that hears the word. The Bible talks about in James 1.22, not just hearing and listening. Some of you are just greatly great hearers. You know, you're just a reservoir of notes and all that stuff. But how have you, It's it's, listen to me. There's a crisis where there's so many people sitting under quality teaching and not reaping the awards and the rewards of the teaching that they sit under. You see, if you are fortunate enough to have a, a, a good pastor, a good leader, a good biblical teacher over your life, there should be a certain measure of prosperity that flows from the principles that govern your life. And James 1.22 gives it to us very clearly. If you are a hearer of the word and you don't do what you have heard, you have deceived yourself. So that also shows you that not living your life or growing in obedience actually opens yourself up to the spirit of deception. And, you know deception is 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 something that that is that 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 increases it, it never happens all at once nobody just wakes up and says oh i'm deceived deception is deception is like a drip feeder it 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 it, it comes in your veins little by little over time uh and it uses the 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 the, the insensitivity you've developed over time to responding to truth when you hear it that's why especially so when it comes to stuff like offerings or sacrifice Sacrifice. You should not give yourself that much time to think about it because it's not likely that you're going to follow through with obeying. Every time God has, has, has directed me or given me an instruction to give something, I have done it in less than 24 hours. I've had to do it because if I wrestle with it too long, I'm going to allow my logic, my intellect, my fear, insecurities, whatever to to call me out of the position of sacrifice that the Spirit of God was positioning me into. So you can't be a procrastinator and be wealthy. You can't be a procrastinator and be great. You can't be hesitant and a double taker and make the godly risks that are necessary for you to go where God is calling you to go in life. So I'm finding that far too many people are not really aware of how how disobedient they are. And you can love the Lord, worship, adore Him, bow, dance, sing, pray, spin, twirl, roll, flip, flop, drip, drop, all of it, and still not have developed the depth of obedience that your destiny requires. Can I submit to you tonight that your destiny requires a level of obedience that only you can grow into. Your teachers can help you. 
the, the, the principles that you hear that govern your life can aid you. But in your inner man, ah, you've got to develop a desire to cultivate an obedient spirit. And if you don't do this, and if you don't take this on as a, as a personal challenge in your life and in your walk, then over time, I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. You're going to thicken the wall of your soul against the spirit of God, against the word of God, against the grip of God, right? And you're going to leave him with this only option, which is to speak to you through life because you refuse to respond to him in your heart. You start, you know, becoming more in desensitized to following his instruction, doing what he says do, moving how he says move, praying when he says pray, obeying how, whatever the instructions or the directions are. What you're doing is you're actually strengthening the parts of you that are prone to rebelling against God and becoming disobedient. And listen to me. I speak to you with paternal love tonight. You cannot afford to live your life that way. You must be obedient. It doesn't matter in what area. It doesn't matter with what instruction. It doesn't matter in what you've got to obey. As you obey, you win a lot of things. Your faith goes to the next level. Your provision goes to the next level. Your resources goes to the next level. As you obey, your discipline goes to the next level. As you obey, your perceptiveness goes to the next level. Obedience teaches you to see the patterns of God. As you obey, you end up developing, even from within yourself, a greater uh, 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 appreciation for time, timeliness. Obedience teaches you how not to waste time. I meet saints around the world bleeding out with regret because of time wasted, either in ignorance or bad relationships or any of that. So obedience has a lot of rewards and becoming an obedient spirit, an obedient soul is something that you really need. And for those of you that are in deliverance processes, God is trying to set you free in your psychological self and in your emotional self, in your spiritual self. The first step to your deliverance is developing the resolve that I must obey. I am either in something right now or something is in me right now that is preventing me from obeying God at the level that I need to obey. And when you come to the resolve of Paul, my life is know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and that the spirit of God lives in you. Your life is not your own. You will stop living, talking, building, acting, pretending as if you are your own property. Mm -mm. You have been bought with a price. And in your gratitude for the eternal purchase and the ransom of your soul, you got to become obedient. Even unto the death of the cross, you've got to obey. So don't feel like your call, and I just feel this prophetically for so many of you right now, that's in a making moment. You are in a season of being molded by God. The molding of the Father is on so many of you watching me tonight. I see this for you. I want to just share this with you. Don't allow Satan to make you feel like you're calling to obedience is a punishment, is a is a is a is an indictment of some sorts, is some sort of cheat, like you've been cheated out of life and cheated out of privilege and cheated out of your right to do. Don't allow Satan to to thwart your understanding of what God is doing in you. And, uh, and of what God is growing in you. See, many of you can't respond to this because Satan will start messing with how you see God's standard for your life. He can't touch it, but he can't touch how you feel about it. And you may start thinking, this is unfair. Why do I have to go without this, go without that? Or why do I have to wait this long? And then, or what is it? You know, why is my life so difficult? Everybody gets stuff so easily. I have to fight for everything I get. Satan will start messing with your perception of God's standard for your life. Listen to me. And if you let him have that, you also give him your worship. 
because you can't worship from a place of wrong perspective. Worship has everything to do with how you see him. And when you see him wrong, you pray amiss, you worship him amiss. If you misunderstand his intent toward you, if you misunderstand what he's doing in you, if you misunderstand what he wants for you, it's going to limit your worship. And where your worship is limited, so is your communication. And unfortunately, so is your obedience. Refuse to allow the forces of darkness to make you feel like your calling to obedience is a prison sentence. It's actually the most liberating thing you could ever learn in your life is to obey him because everything, I want you to hear this, no matter how brutal, no matter how painful, no matter how excruciating it may feel at the present, God always has your best interest at heart. I want you to receive some deliverance right now and write that God always has your best interest at heart. Type that right now. You need to make that a pillar of your next set of actions. No matter what God calls me into, it is always with my best interest at heart. Believe that. Come on. That's right. God always has your best. No matter what he calls you to do, no matter what he requires of you, no matter how high the standard is, no matter how long and exaggerated the season is, God always has your best interest at heart. And if his hand is responsible for something that you are facing right now, the only way Satan can take advantage of it is if you give the credit to him by feeling like it's an attack when it's really a call into a new level of trustworthiness and compatibility to and for and before the Lord your God. So hear my heart tonight. I feel like God is talking to us about obedience because he is calling us into some things that we would never ascribe to him. And that we would never believe we could go into. He is calling us into some networks. He is calling us into some circles. He is calling us into some opportunities. He is calling us into certain levels of influence. He is calling us to go some places. To coexist with some people. To speak and have opportunity to give language to some things. That if you're not careful, you would think was the devil. But when you develop the compass of the spirit, that prophetic compass on the inside, because you are accustomed to being obedient and you can say like Jesus, I only do what I see the father doing. The, the policy for his entire destiny was I obey the father. When you obey the father, you end up being cultivated into a choice weapon in the hand of God. Uh, Jeremiah calls it. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, well, Isaiah calls it a, a polished arrow hidden for him and a shout out for how he needs you. Did this bless you? Let me know that this blessed you. I need some feedback. Did this bless you? I want to be obedient. I want to be obedient to God. I want to be obedient to my leaders. I want to be obedient to my counsel. I want to be obedient to my teachers. I want an obedient spirit. That's how you walk into greatness. God doesn't promote the rebels, please. He allows them to be devoured by life and their decisions. He turns them over. He releases them into the consequences of their doings. He doesn't promote rebels. You're rebellious. The only thing you have to look forward to is sudden and quick and unsuspected destruction. I've got to be obedient. He's calling you to obey. So I hope this blessed you and I hope this is something for you to meditate upon and something for you to consider because you really need to know it. It's very important to God. Hey, I love you so much. I bid you peace in the precious name of Jesus. Join me tomorrow at Periscope. Uh, we've got so much going on. Again, I'll be in California uh, with Apostle Sherman Dumas this weekend and then with Bishop Keith O'Neill Sunday and then with my great church, the All Nations Worship Assembly of Chicago for an 8.30 and 11.30 on this Sunday uh, at 73.59 in Chappelle. It's going to be amazing. Uh, we're getting ready to, for so many events that I want you to be a part of. I love y'all so much. Y'all are amazing to me. 
And I want you to make it your obligation to be there, whether it's deep or still or our young adult shut in or whatever you're coming to. It's going to be amazing. All right. So be looking forward to that. Congratulations to Pastor LeBryan friend. I'm going to be installing him as the senior pastor of All Nations Worship Assembly of Atlanta, Georgia. Go and follow him, Periscope. He is amazing, a son of this movement, and he is getting ready to erect a temple in the name of the Lord in Atlanta. Uh, so it's going to be off the chain. Night Brand, you're coming to Deeper Steel. Please don't disappoint me. I need to get in your presence and make sure you're where you need to be. Tiffany Montgomery, so good to see you. I did quite a bit of talking about you this weekend. Uh, so good to see all of you. For more information about me, go to my Facebook page, Dr. Matthew L. Stevenson III, or my IG, Dr. Matthew L. Stevenson, or my website, MatthewStevensonWorldwide.com or AllNationsWA.com, and you can find out more information about us there. I God bless you. Have a good night. Rest, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.